working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everybody, this is Matthew Krause, and you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today is my guest, Rick Malkin. Rick is a drummer and photographer based in Nashville, Tennessee. He was the drum tech for session legend Eddie Bayers for 11 years. From an early age, Rick honed his drumming skills in the theater and continues to stay involved in the theater community. Rick gives insight and tells some cool stories about some great drummers he's had the opportunity to work with as a photographer. In a 2011 Drum Magazine article, it says, If you want a model for how to make a living mixing several drum-related careers, Malkin's your man. As always, you can go to workingdrummer.net where you can find out more about this podcast and see pictures and to get other information about other podcasts we've done. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can go to iTunes where you can subscribe to the podcast and a new episode will be sent to your smart device. While you're in iTunes, you can rate the podcast and uh, include a comment. It always helps us grow. We are sponsored today by Aquarian Drumheads, makers of the Aquarian Multipurpose Super Pad. Both a great feeling pad for quiet practice and a responsive drum mute for low volume music making. Every drummer needs to turn the volume down sometime. The Super Pad by Aquarian Drumheads can keep the drummer playing all of the time. Check out the Super Pad and the full line of Aquarian Drumheads and accessories at AquarianDrumheads.com. So let's get to it. Here is Rick Malkin. I found a 2011 article written by John Aldridge that mentioned you as when he was talking about Nashville. Drummers in Nashville, and I'm trying to remember what the name... Oh, it was from Magazine. And it was saying, hey, if you want to move to Nashville, this is 2011. And it's amazing, even in reading the article, how much things have changed in the last five years. Unbelievable. And your name is in there. They talk about... He said, Rick is the guy that is juggling many things. He is kind of the go-to. What is he? He writes, uh, if you want a model for how to make a living mixing several drum-related careers, Malkin's your man. How cool. I wonder what that... Because people, sometimes people would call me from out of town or move in here, yeah. and I would tell them not to. <laughs> I said, there's too many drummers here, man. And one guy called me up, and he's telling me what kind of drum set he has and the cymbals he has. I go, it doesn't matter. First of all, you won't use them. That's true. There's That's a, true. But people a, don't hire you on what kind of what brand drums you have. Yeah, yeah. But but but, but I mean, how do you, has that much has that changed very much in the last five years? I mean, think about it. You've got this new article that just came out in Drum Magazine. Well, first Jim Handley, no, no, Glenn Kruba wrote the article. Yeah, yeah. And he called me or emailed me mm-hmm. and included me in that in the drum text of Nashville. Mm-hmm. And I haven't done it, you know, in the last few years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was really flattered. And then. Like a month later, Andy Dorshak, who's moving here, mm-hmm. uh, contacted me and wanted me to do the pictures for this article that's coming up. And I went, man, I'm already involved. I'm one of the drummers. He went, you are? <laughs> he didn't know. Yeah. And I even at- talked to Jim Hanley afterwards. I said, I'm really flattered that I was here, yeah. that I was invited. He goes, man, you did it before any of us. And I went, wow, I worked for Eddie for 11 years. Okay. You know, I set up his drums, I tuned yeah. them, I played them for the engineers. We went on the road a few times. Yeah. I went out and bought cargo shorts and uh, and a mag light and uh, hit the road. You wear all black? Did you have a ponytail? Always. Did you no ponytail. No hat ponytail. With a ponytail attached to I it? I may have had a hat. I don't wear hats very much. Okay. I can't. I can't. I can't stand it. <laughs> I tried the other night again at a gig because the lights were hitting right yeah. in my eyes. And I thought, well, if I wear a hat, and I went, I can't do it. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I'll never make it in this town. Um, so when did you start doing the tech stuff? Well, it was weird. I moved, I came down here, I was living in Pittsburgh and I came down here to take pictures for modern drummer of national drummers. Yeah. Robin Flans had already been here and interviewed like five guys. And that's that modern drummer issue with those guys on the front. Nope. That, nope. That's, that was even way after that. This okay. was, uh, uh, it wasn't even covers. It was like Eddie Bayers, uh, Kerrigan, Kroon, mm-hmm. Gene Chrisman, maybe I came and stayed in a motel, mm-hmm. uh, what year was this? Uh, hmm, I'd have to look it up. Oh, really? Late 80s, 90s. Okay. Before, you know, I was living in Pittsburgh, flew down here, rented a car, and uh, took pictures of Eddie the first day at the, hmm, what's the name of that studio? The Mill? Alabama recorded all their stuff at this studio. Okay. The water, water, no. And as soon as I saw Eddie, we became best friends. I mean, that day, same hair, 
saying so many things in common. I was at his house having dinner that night. That's and cool. uh, and and they said, man, you need to move here, him and his wife. You need to move here. We'll help you get work, you know, as a drummer and whatever. So, uh, and his wife used to call me and say, hey, Rick, when are you coming home? You know, it was great. So eventually I packed up. I came down here uh, a couple more times, I think, for other drum things, drum article things. Yeah. And uh, packed up my little car and my and uh, trailer and moved down here. And Eddie, I used to hang out with Eddie, and it didn't happen for a while. You know, I auditioned for stuff and mm-hmm. I ended up wor- working at Opryland for two years in a gospel group playing drums. Okay. Which was fun. Joined the union. Yeah. Th- I thought I had to join the union at the time. Right, right, right. Uh, and I even called Eddie when I got offered the job. I said, man, should I do this job? He goes, yeah, because that's a great place to work. Yeah. And he used to come all the time with his wife and kids back then. Wow. It was great. And uh, and just I used to go to sessions, and somebody needed to plug his stuff in. There was a guy that was doing it. We all know. He used to plug his stuff in. Eddie had a rack that was like the size of a refrigerator yeah. back in those days. Yeah. And they would plug all the stuff in and play the drums for the engineer. So a couple of times I did it. Yeah. Then did I ended up getting the gig doing that. And then eventually I started carrying his drums around. Okay. And that rack was a real big pain i had a van an astro van and this rack was on wheels on a size of a refrigerator yeah and i used to slide it in my van somehow and bring his drums to sessions and and eventually he quit using the rack okay he just started using just a drum machine for click and that was it i don't know at least i'm gonna say what was in the rack simmons five uh the biggest thing was a sampler a kai sampler right was the biggest thing back in those Jeez. days side stick and all the drums were, I mean, triggers on all the drums. Uh, Rolf Zweeb used to make triggers. Okay. Or Michael Young first made them. Drummer named Michael Young, another good guy. Okay. Made Eddie's triggers back in those days. Man. And there were triggers hot glued in all his drums. Yeah. Yeah, right up near the head. And I'd plug everything in and with a snake and dum dum dum, you know, and uh, side sick. Wow. Yeah, it was great. So I would get to the session before Eddie, you know, either that morning or the night before, set up drums, yeah. do all the sounds with the engineer, you know, leisurely. Uh-huh. And uh, my whole life was centered around that. All my gigs that I was doing on the side and uh, everything I did was based around Eddie's schedule. And I had engineers' home numbers. I'd say, okay, I'm done with my gig. Can I get into the studio? They'd come unlock the studio for me at 11 or 12 o'clock at oh, night. after your gig. Yeah. And then go in there. And I'd go in, set up the drums, do all the stuff. And then Eddie would come in the next morning at 9 for a 10 o'clock session. Jeez. You know, hit drums and everything yeah. was hopefully yeah. close to being right. And you did that for 11 years? Yeah. Um, Every day. I, and eventually I had two drum sets going. And were you doing, when you moved down, were you, did you continue? Were you starting photography? Or oh, I've been doing photography? photography. My dad was a photographer. Okay. So I've been doing that since I was okay. born. Okay. So I've always had that to you, fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you what came first. Drums, photography, kind of like. Yeah, photography for sure. Two? I started playing when I was 10 playing drums okay in grade school in pittsburgh yeah in monroeville suburb of pittsburgh yeah you had to choose an instrument yeah and i didn't want to have to learn how to read read music because i'm lazy (laughs) and uh that's why i'm not a doctor because i'm lazy i wanted to be a doctor yeah and i said how many years of school (laughs) you know my mother used to say if i could learn it from a tape or something you know i would have been a great doctor (laughs) but i was a candy striper and everything in a hospital i thought i thought that was it and uh so i Decided on drums because I didn't want to have to learn how to read music. Yeah. And now what's weird is everything I do playing wise now is reading music. Right, right. Working with theater, theaters. theater, big band, yeah. everything I do. So I'm a great faker. Probably more so than a lot of people in town. That just seems right. like a very niche kind of thing right. in, a, in a town like this. Um, it's hard to find people. Like if I, when I was looking for subs, yeah, it was hard to find guys that could read. Yeah. You know, and uh, everybody's, oh, I played a shows in my high school. Everybody always had played a show in their high school. Right. But... And, and I play differently. I don't, I'm not a great reader. I'm not a great percussionist. I can't go blah, 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 on bells. You know, I can go ding, 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 and maybe hit the right note occasionally. <laughs> Luckily, they're marked. Yeah. You know, and I do the every good boy D, D, you know. Right, 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 right. I get that. And I write all that out. And uh, I've been getting away with it for a long time. I but mean, if you weren't reading in high school, I mean, how did you, what led you into doing theater work? And were you I doing started that? playing a show when I was 14. And it's really weird. It was a synagogue that we used to go to. Mm-hmm. They were doing a show. And my brother was in the show. And they didn't have a drummer. They just had a piano player. Yeah. I still have that script at home where I wrote what I played on each song. 
And most of the theater stuff I did starting then, nobody would rent the scores from New York. Mm -hmm. They would just hand me a program with the song lists in it. And I still have them in my scrapbook. Oh, I should have brought my scrapbook. Uh, I'd say, you know, Cowbell or whatever. I'd write little <laughs> things next so to each song. So you were making up your own parts? Right. Did they have recordings of this stuff? Sometimes, yeah. back in those days. Okay. And the, one sh the first show they had a book for was a show called I Do, I Do. Yeah. And they, came, they handed me the book. I went to the library and got the uh, record album out of the library. Yeah. And I sat there with the book. And it was weird because there were some songs in the book that weren't on the record album. And I oh. went, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh like the last song in the show is called Roll Up the Ribbons okay they had an anniversary or something it was, a, it was a two people show couple and then the next song was Bows I thought actually it was Bowels it was like the last song in the show I thought it was Bows that's how much I knew back then <laughs> that's pretty funny um, great show it was fun we did that show a long time did you I mean did you learn to read on your own then? yeah just putting the pieces together yeah learn it from the record then I got called to do Jesus Christ Superstar at a church I memorized it with the book Wow. I had the double album set, and I sat down with the book and memorized the entire show with the music. Yeah, you know, turning pages, and it was like a guide for me. So it's it, scary, very scary. One uh, seems like a problem I see a lot of those who read and use charts, and uh, I've been working a lot on cruise ships the last few years. And right, oh, you have to and read. I see these and musicians. Well, not not with the gig that I do, but when I see the the musicians that work full time on the ships, yeah, they're reading, and a lot of times they're playing uh, an arrangement of an ACDC song, and their heads are just stuck in the chart. And when I used to do big band stuff. That was one of the things that the guy said, Matt, get your head out of the chart. You know, you got 32 bars of solo. You don't need to look. You're not counting. Feel it. Listen to the sax player. That's what I say you all know. the time. That's, so, yeah, but, but I'm years, wondering, years. you're doing Jesus Christ Superstar. You memorized it, but you have to let... It's a secret. So were you deliberately looking at the charts? Oh, pretend? I read it. That's how I learned how to read. Yeah. I mean, I would go, oh. And every rehearsal, every show, I'd go, oh, that's what they mean. Oh. <laughs> I, and we did it in, with that guy. I don't know. He keeps saying that, right? Saying right. That. And we did it in Pittsburgh, and it was great because it was. They got, I go into the church that we were doing the show at, and they had a full orchestra, like oh, strings oh, and everything. Oh. And I'm like, oh, uh oh. And yeah. uh, but then the four of us there was a rock group, mm -hmm. so we we got to wear our black t-shirts and the orchestra people had to get dressed up. Oh, that's cool. And we nailed it, man. It was just yeah. so much fun. I was gonna say, did that did, was that like the bug that got you to oh, do yeah. more theater stuff? And well, pretty yeah. I just I don't know what it is about theater. Even now, I listen to the station on XM, yeah. the Broadway Channel. There's yeah. something about it, the camaraderie, the family, yeah, the caring. And then I, when I work with musicians that don't care, it bothers me. I work with other players that yeah. just read the book, don't look up from the book, and well, I, know. Uh, I know they don't care. Yeah, I, it, it's just it's it's a whole different animal, right? And uh, it, it, it seems like different towns have this very kind of, uh, they have a personality about them. And Nashville has a personality about it. So I'm just There's about curious. three or four of us that do the, th the shows in Nashville. Cool. And the most recent one was the boiler room that you were in? Yeah, 13 and years. 13 years. So how does that work? I mean, are you you're, as the staff drummer? You're yeah, the guy that I played every show. I subbed out maybe two or three times, maybe, at the in most. In those 13 years? Yeah. I'm real... Uh, and how often did that, how did that keep, I mean, how often were you working? Uh, we did shows like four times a week. We'd come in the week before the show opened to rehearse musically. And the cast has been rehearsing for a month or two. Yeah. And we came in the week before and did, you know, tech night. Yeah. Which took hours and hours and hours setting up lights and sound. Yeah. And, uh, but my big thing is I adapt to the theater. You know, you can't just read the part. Right. Some guys can do that. They come into a theater and they just read what's written. They don't listen to what singing is going on, what the rest of the band is doing. Uh -huh. We don't. We only have one sax player. We don't have four sax players, a trombone, three trumpets. So the book is for, it's just a standard book. Right, from That's New York, good. rented from New York. Uh -huh. And the leader will give you the cuts. You know, we're cutting this song, we're cutting that song. We're going from measure this to this because we don't have room to do these big dance numbers. It was a little theater, 120-seat theater. I understand. And I adapted to it, you know. I brought woodblock, woodblock cowbells, wind chimes, uh, timpani. I have a little timpani I use. Yeah, how fun is that? And I just make it fit the theater. Were you playing mallet as mallet percussion as, as well? I brought my little xylophone, my cheap little student xylophone. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I would hit the E at the end of a song. Or <laughs> I have a great triangle. You know, I use this triangle that's an, um, one of a kind. It's an old lady antique triangle. Yeah. And it yeah. sounds more like a bell than a triangle. There was a theater in Pittsburgh you said you worked at for a long time. 
Well, I worked. There was one called the Odd Chair Playhouse. We yeah. did hair back in '74, '75. Wow. Sold out every night. It was like a big celebrity thing, man. If you didn't see hair, you were nobody. Wow. Everybody came to that show. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Rogers used to come, and I think I had um, that on vinyl somewhere. We oh, great music! But the authors. Not the music guy, but the two guys that wrote the words and the lyrics and stuff uh-huh. came to the show almost every day. They one guy lived near there, really. So they were hanging out. I got pictures with them, and uh, we had no idea. We were on a and the band was on a loft above the stage. I was using my old Rogers, twenty, thirteen, eighteen inch floor tom. Eighteen, kit. twenty, thirteen. It was 18. like half a kit that I bought from Script a, Rogers. Yeah, all yeah. the Pink Strata. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And it, was, it must have been half a kit that this drum shop sold to me. It was my first name kit. My kit before that was a Zimgar. Zimgar. Yeah. And then there was Gar Zim. And I found out later that's the name of two guys, like short names. These two guys brought the stuff over from China. Yeah. And I got it at a pawn shop, that kit. It, wow. was, it was brand new, but I got it at a pawn shop. They're the henchman in a Disney movie or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, Great so, drums. So. But you grew up there mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh. Yep. Were you, how much photography were you doing at that a time? A lot, a lot. Working for my dad. Okay. You know, uh, work, he would go out of town. I'd run, I'd do the stuff. Was he you working know? on his own? Oh, he, he was, that's what he did. It's all, it's all okay. I known. He was a photographer. Okay. We did, you know, events. That's how I got into shooting pictures at the uh, Stanley Theater. Yeah. He got called to shoot a thing for Warner Brothers with, for Steve Martin. Oh, wow. When Steve Martin was huge, he came to yeah. uh, Pittsburgh yeah. My dad did it, and then there was some other event he couldn't do, and I went, and I started doing it. That was for Warner Brothers. Wow. And then eventually I started shooting at the Stanley Theater. Yeah. Bob Marley's last concert, and Teddy Pendergrass, Rick James, I mean, just Liza Minnelli. I have pictures of all these people. Yeah. I was the guy. They'd yeah. walk, I'd walk in and go, hey, no cameras. Oh, Rick, come on in. Oh, that's I'd awesome. walk right in, and, yeah. and the big thing was taking pictures of the artists with the promoters at yeah. the end of the show holding a plaque. Oh, so I was funny. in the dress rooms, Frank Zappa. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I mean, before we came in here to start recording, you had all those pictures in your car yeah. and you were showing me. And um, I, we should just mention, uh, just before you came over, I turn on the radio and immediately they're talking about Prince, who yeah. just died. And uh, just the, this is just an insane year uh, for that stuff to happen. And it's and early in the year. Me, yeah, it's early in the year. I know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, yeah, he was close an to the end of April. And you had a picture. Yeah, he was an opening act, and I took his picture. He was just sitting in the theater after the concert, waiting for his ride. And I said, "Hey, can I take your picture?" He went, "Yeah." What year? Took, do you know? It's got to be eighty something. Really? I, I just talked to the guy in Pittsburgh. I, I, we need to figure it out. It was he was opening for maybe Rick James or somebody? My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody even knew, you know, who he was back then. Yeah. But he was nice to me. Yeah. I had Buddy Rich's uh, cover when he passed away. 80s. And I just had, and I was, and Mike Baird was playing with Journey, and I was yes. supposed to have the Mike Baird cover. Mm-hmm. So Baird was in Pittsburgh rehearsing and then doing a concert with Journey. I took all these great pictures. Mike was excited he was going to be on the cover, and then Buddy Rich died. Mm-hmm. So Buddy Rich got the cover, and it happened to be a picture of mine, and then Mike Baird was an inset picture. I had that issue. Uh, I know I had that issue because uh, when I was about 13, I saw Buddy play in Columbus. Yeah. And I went on his bus. That's where I took the picture, right on his front seat. He was sitting in the front seat after yes. the show with a towel around his neck. That's how I, that's, that's right. how I picture him. And that's because the picture I had. I went to take a picture of him, and the film wasn't loaded correctly. I, mm. I got his autograph on a piece of paper, and then he passed away, and I put that autograph in that modern drummer together. And then I went on a road trip, like this church youth group road trip, and yeah. I left the magazine on the bus. See, church groups will do that to you. So they you got to stop. Yeah, you gotta, it's not good. But yeah. that, that is what I envision. when I, I have to just replay that experience in my mind because I don't have that documentation, whatever. But it's him sitting up in the front lounge in a robe, towel around his neck. That's the shot. And I shot that in Washington, D.C. He played at the Blue... Blues Alley, was it called? Something Alley? Okay. In Washington, D.C. No, I, I, I wonder if it was the same tour. Uh, and he had he had a kit that somebody had just redone for him. It was an old Leedy kit. Yeah. And each drum had a plaque on it said for Buddy Rich or something something for Buddy Rich on each drum. Yeah. So I went up yeah. and looked at him. Well, can, And I met him in 74. I mean, I used to go see him when he played anywhere near Pittsburgh. Yeah. North Hills, Greensburg. I mean, yeah. I'd get my Dodge Dart and, yeah. and drive to go see him. And it was just 
the power yeah. and just unbelievable. And every time he was on TV, I get to stay up late and watch him. Yeah. And then uh, in 1974, he was playing in Pittsburgh at a club with his jazz group mm-hmm. for two or three nights. And I was in college. And I took the bus home from college, two-hour bus ride, ran down to this place where he was playing. My friend had already gotten his tickets Jeez. at a table, watched them, took pictures, yeah. went home that night, developed the film, and dried it with a hair dryer. And the film got dirt on it, too. There was little spots on them. Printed out some pictures, went the next night, showed them to him. He put on glasses to look at them. Yeah. You never see him with reading glasses. Right, right. And uh, he looked at the pictures and liked them, and he autographed one for me. Yeah. and watched him play and he was putting on Jeanette cologne yeah. which was the cologne I used to buy my female friends back in those days you know <laughs> as presents bath splash I went boy he smells really good and he was putting on Jeanette just you know just splashing it on it's great but he knew he was always nice to me you know all the times I'd met him and there was never any weird stuff Combining your love of drums and photography together and, yeah, it's and making, awesome. is, it, is it just a no-brainer? Has it just always just kind of happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then guys would come to the Stanley Theater, and that's why I met Kenny Aronoff there and Trius and Bowden, and God, I met everybody. I'd go talk to the drummers. Eddie Anderson I met way back when. He was playing with Dolly Parton on National Is this Guy. before you were kind of involved more in the industry where people knew you, say, through oh, Modern yeah. Drummer? Oh, yeah. that was, And I used to call Modern Drummer. Uh, a guy named Scott Fish was one of the editors back then. I would call him up and I'd say, hey, man, I want a cover. How can I get a cover? And he'd always go, you, man, man, you live in Pittsburgh, he would say. Yeah. You know? So. Uh, what did that mean? Like, it meant that, you know, I don't live in L.A. I don't live in New York. I'm yeah. living in Pittsburgh. You know, yeah. if I was living in L.A. or New York, I would get some cover shots. Yeah. You so, think that's still a problem? Uh, not as much because Nashville is happening. Well, Everybody's right. But coming I mean, for here. somebody that lives in Pittsburgh. Probably. Yeah, for cover shots, yeah. Yeah, you know, because now I'm, you know, Nashville's the place. Yeah, or L.A. There's a guy in L.A. that does all the cover uh, covers for Modern Drummer out there. If I was in L.A., I'd, I'd still probably still be doing that. Well, what was the first cover? Was it Modern Drummer? Yeah, and I'm thinking it was uh, my first assignment. I told you outside was John Densmore. When I moved to L.A., I moved to L.A. in eighty and and I and, two. And, and, and I, the name did not. I know. Me too. They called me and said we want you to shoot John Densmore. Rick Mattingly called me, uh-huh. and I said, yeah. "Who?" Yeah. And he went, "What do you mean who?" Yeah. You know. And I went to John Densmore's house, and we took out his drums out of the garage and set them up in his living room, and had gold albums all over the walls. You know, the doors. And, yeah. Oh, he became a good friend back then. That's awesome. Good guy. I didn't recognize that, so I'm admitting. I know. I'm, I know. I'm admitting here that I, the name didn't. Ring a bell, and it's the drummer for the Doors. Yeah, that was my first assignment. My first cover, I think, was Earl Palmer. Okay, if I remember right, chronologically speaking. Do you, do you remember what year? Eighty-three, maybe. Okay. Famous cover too. I Man, that covers all over the place. And then Earl wrote a book, an autobiography, and somebody called me one day and said, "Hey, man, congratulations on the cover." And I went, "What cover?" He said, oh, "Earl Palmer's book." I didn't know anything about it, and it was Smithsonian Press from Washington. So I was in Washington, went to Smithsonian Institute, went to the bookshop, and I took a picture of me holding the book. (laughs) And I contacted them. I said, hey, where'd you get this picture? And then, because they said, oh, we tried to get hold of you. We didn't know where to find you. (laughs) So it's kind of cool. Earl was a good guy, and I hung out with him. Uh, He was recording music for Chips, the TV show. (laughs) And he's sitting there with a cigarette, and his drums were old heads. And man, what a reader. I mean, the, the charts for TV shows are just stupid. Oh, they are. They are. There's They're four. I measure a one because the guy's reaching for a doorknob. You know, the, the music needs to match up. Yeah. He, and he would, he would look at the music, and the lights would go out, and a red light would come on, and he would close his eyes and play the chart. I was just unbelievable. I was just so amazed at him, the, the talent. I just went, wow. You know, it's so funny because when I see old movies and especially old TV shows where you know that stuff was produced so fast on a weekly basis wow. and you hear real musicians playing, right. it's, it, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the production value of that stuff that we don't hear as much today, um, just in this digital, more digital era. Right. Uh, and I was too young to kind of recognize. You hear stuff from the 1940s and 50s and different things like that. But then even going back to the 80s, where real players in the studio... Earl Palmer. Were just Earl Palmer was stuff. playing Chip's TV show, 16th Notes on a Hi-Hat. Yeah, I know. You know this guy played on that, huge hits. And there's the car driving down. the. Right. Then it hits a bump and it goes flying through the air. And the strings come in. And then there's the... 
the uh, single-headed toms. I always remember, you know, here here they come driving down the highway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And his heads were old. He didn't have endorsements. That's so funny. None of his symbols were shiny. We used he to didn't see. care about any of that, and he's playing his butt off, you know. Yeah. And wasn't it was his job? That was a big joke between my friends and I. Do you know the car chase and chips and that music that comes on with the strings and there's a classic hi hat and sixteenth right. notes? Then there's that big drum fill as the cars flying through the air. Earl Palmer, man, a lot Earl of it. Earl Palmer, a lot of it. My yep. world is just it's. And and I, and it was like and I used to go to sessions. I'd hang out with him. And I uh, one trip I hung out with Mike Baird. Yeah. who people don't talk about anymore. And he's still out there playing, but he used to do all the Mike Post TV shows, Hill Street Blues. And so I spent a day with him one day yeah. at two different studios yeah. and just watched him. And man, he could sight read. Again, it's all sight reading. Yeah. You, know, you don't take it home and learn it from an album like I do. You got to <laughs> sight read that stuff. And man, he was just incredible. And I'd look over and at these sessions I used to go to. I shot Steve Schaefer at a movie soundtrack. Okay. And... Uh, Joe Picaro and uh, 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 Emo Richards was there. Mm. I mean, these are classic guys. Yeah. And I just had to lay on the floor. I couldn't make any noise, you know, in between takes. And it was incredible. And uh, I was at one session, Tommy Tedesco playing guitar. Uh, Al Viola, I think was his name, was Frank Sinatra's guitar player. They're doing sessions. Yeah. I mean, these are legends. Right. And there I am. But kind of like more pop or yeah. you know, just whatever. I remember they did. For. They did. Uh, Da -da, te tequila. They were doing it one session, and Tommy Tedesco was. They put a microphone up, and he's the one who went tequila. And <laughs> and there's me, man. Just and it was like no big deal back then. There's no who are you, what are you doing. They knew I was with somebody, and it was cool. I was there with friends with somebody. Now things are so. What are you doing? Who, what are these pictures for? You know. Why uh, is it? I don't know. It's just overwhelmed, over uh, saturated. Yeah. I don't know. Everybody wants to know who's making money, who's getting paid. Yeah. For the pictures, yeah. when I lived in L.A., you could drive down the street and you see them shooting a movie. You could pull over and to hang out. Mm -hmm. I was I got pictures of Eric Estrada sitting on a motorcycle right by my house in L.A. Great picture. It's in uh, that big notebook yeah. out there. And now you the security's out there. Put your camera away. No, you can't do that. Hmm. Change everybody totally. Everybody has a camera. Yeah, that's that's yeah. my other thing nowadays. Everybody owns a camera now. When I get a gig, either drumming or photography, I usually keep it for a long time. It's not like, you know, you'll meet some musicians that have this huge resume. They worked for a week with each person. Right. You know. I do a church gig. I've been there almost 10 years. Uh, the theater, 13 years. They closed, you know, before I could quit. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, yeah, they were open for 12 years, but you played there for 13 years. Yeah, exactly. really yeah sure that one year. Yeah, they were like, who, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> what, is there... Is the theater scene kind of just changing here in Nashville? Can oh, there's still on? there's still lots of stuff going on. Yeah, I'm just uh, and it's weird because a lot of people knew I worked at that theater, so they wouldn't call me for other stuff. Now I'm just there's the other guys move up. That's the way Nashville is. You say no to one person, the other guys move up, which right. is fine. I'm not. I'm I'm happy. I'm doing what I want to do. Right. And there's always that person that you know, whether it's a guy in a band or an engineer or whatever, they're, they're, they're going to call you so many times and then right. they're just not going to call you and you can't, right. we're all, in, we, sometimes if we're on the other side of the, that, there's people that I want to play with, but I, they've never been available, you know, and I'm sure. You've, you've never versa. called me. Oh wait, you play drums. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can see, all my pictures have been taken already. Yeah. Know? Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you have all the pictures you need. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it might be time for a new one. Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'll give you my number, and uh, just well, don't call me on a Sunday. <laughs> so I I'm know. like, I'm doing. So I got some theater things. I'm coming up. I got a thing coming up in uh, June. I've been subbing a lot for different bands. One band I subbed for, the drummer broke his ankle, and I was scheduled to do their pictures that night. And it's funny because they called me and said, "Man, can you come play tonight uh, too?" Yeah. And do the pictures. You know, they yeah. needed some because they were. It was a cool event. And so I ended up playing that night because yeah. the drummer broke his ankle the day before. Yeah. What so kind of music was it? Rock, rock, rock stuff. They sent me a set list at you know ten o'clock in the morning. And I sat there on YouTube and went through every song, got tempos, and uh, yeah, yeah. And I was ready. So, are you, as far as the the subbing and the gigs, is it just all over the map? Yeah. Style wise. Oh yeah. That's yeah. and that's another cool thing about theater. Every show is different. Oh, right. Right. We did Rent. We did uh, you know nineteen forties radio hour which was all 40s music. Every show is different. 
and I have different drums, different stuff I use for every I was show. I just going to ask you that. Yeah, I mean, how do you I have a Leedy that? kit, you know, the, a 22 or 24-inch bass drum I use for vintage stuff, and then I have shiny stuff, you know, for other shows. Right. And are the are you using different types of heads and the tunings, the match? Oh, yeah, set? all the time. I change. And, and that's something, too, to make everything different every gig. You know, like I take a different snare drum to church every Sunday. Just because it makes it different. It gives me something to look forward to. Oh, tomorrow I'm using the Aot. Tomorrow I'm using the Legend. I have Legend snare drums. I have... Yeah. God, I have so much stuff. Do you have opportunities to record? Nope. No? And I'm honest about it. Yeah. You know, I don't lie. Oh, I'm doing sessions. I'm, people used to come up to me and tell me stuff like that. They were doing sessions, and I'm thinking, no, you're not. I was at that session. I set the drums up for that session. That wasn't you. <laughs> it would be funny. Guys would just lie yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Well, are there are are there uh, theater performances that have been recorded like in the past? Or have there been situations where you've been able? Have you been interested in that part of the production? No, they don't. People don't call me for that, and I'm and I'm honest about it. You know, I'm yeah. not a session guy. Yeah, I've done some stuff. You know, you can some demo things. And I remember I did a session for some woman one time, and and they wanted some uh, conga parts. And then back then I had the drum cat, right, right, thing, right. and I had and I was playing it. With sticks, and she came over and said, "Could you play it with your hands? It would probably sound better." You know, and I just that was that was right, funny. On the ca- yeah, on the drum cat with the Can rubber, really the rubber, feel yeah, the hand totally different sound, totally different to get sound, a slap. different sound. <laughs> <laughs> but I was honest, man. I, I watched what Eddie did every day, and I just there's a mentality about it. Um, there's reasons that he's where he is, who he is. Yeah, you know, he's it's it's got so much more to do than playing a paradiddle and. The chop things, you know? Yeah. It's got so much more to do it, personality-wise, feel, soul. Yeah. You smell good. You know, you're funny. You're just, you don't have an attitude. There's so much more to being a session musician. Mm-hmm. And I should just watch him and be amazed. Mm. One day he was doing a thing, a rock thing. Lee Sklar is playing bass. Mm-hmm. And uh, Eddie said, go get me double pedals. I went, what? And I went and got him double pedals. He was playing double pedals. Like, go... Get them out of cartage or go, go buy them? Go get a set. Yeah, I went to, uh, I guess it was Pearl back then. I went and got him a du- double pedals. What? And he played double pedals. And I just went, how do you know how to do all this? <laughs> yeah. He amazed me every day. Wow. But you talk about, there's just all these other elements. There's the personality. There's just the, I mean, we all think about feel and... And quick. And you have to be quick. You have to learn fast. There's no, uh, let's do that again. Or, oh, you didn't want this or you didn't want that. He'd get stuff on first takes. It, it amazed me every day. Yeah, how he did it, and yeah. then, and a lot of guys, you know, that there's they just can't do that. Yeah, you know, even besides drums, just other instruments, and they don't get called again. Yeah, if, it, if they have to take too much time. Well, let me ask you. I mean, was that was that just kind of an, an intimidating factor? And like, okay, because you're looking at one of the most recorded drummers, yep, in the country, yep, and being around him that. Yeah, you can learn so much, but it also could be like this overwhelming, like, I don't know what other word to use then, just other, in, this intimidating environment. That well, like, I just, I saw what he did and how he did it, and, and he's, you can't, I can't do that. That red light comes on, I can't just play like he did. Well, you know? right, but I think that, you know, there's, there's all these situations, but, but you've put yourself in other situations in the past like with with the theater stuff yeah where you're like well i can't read but then but this is but this is how fun is this how cool is challenging oh yeah man the first few shows brutal and i and i would be scared i would actually be nervous yeah and uh there was a show we did one time the 1940s radio hour and i had to get a sub for opening night it was like maybe a nam show or pas show i had to go to for the opening weekend so i never got to rehearse Oh, so you knew ahead of time the scheduling, and I got this other drummer to do it, yeah. you know, to play. I brought the drums. I used my vintage kit. Yeah. I let him play the opening weekend. Yeah. And I remember being backstage waiting to go on, and I'm going, I haven't rehearsed. I have no idea this what wasn't we're doing. That long ago. Uh, it's, it was during that 13 year period. We oh. did that show twice, 1940s Radio Hour. Okay. And I had no idea what I was going to do. But it and wasn't when you were a kid, not really. Oh, no, 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 no. This no. is right. No. This is full Recently, on. I subbed on uh, Fiddler on the Roof. A drummer's somebody, a family member, and a drummer's family died. And they called me the day before, and I had to come in and sight read. Okay, and I was pretty nervous. Is the community still close knit in a town like this? Oh yeah, big time. So even though the theater you were playing at isn't there, but you right. still have that connection with those people. Yeah, because one of the actors was also the director of that show. Yeah, that I subbed for, and he put my name. Yeah, he went. I know a guy. 
Yeah. You know, and then I got him a gig as a, in another show. I was playing the lead guy bailed right before we were opening mm. as an actor. And I went, I know a guy. You know? You're right, right. And he came in, shaved his head, and he was the lead in uh, Annie, a uh, little orphan, a little, uh, yeah, a little orphan show. Annie, get yeah. your gun. No, that's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a medley. It's, it's, a, it's a new show. It's a new mashup. Yeah, she carries a rifle. And, yeah. <laughs> Why are you an orphan? Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I take pictures of drummers, and I'm a drummer, so I shoot them as if it was a drummer shooting them. I see pictures of other drummers you know, in magazines, and I can tell it wasn't a drummer Bye. taking the pictures. We want to see how they're holding the sticks, how they're sitting, how their feet are, what shoes they're wearing. You know, we... Drummers care about all that stuff. Yeah. I yeah. shot a very, very famous drummer uh, <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, I shot him that way, you know? I, yeah. I, want to see, I shot what I want to see. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not shooting them as a model. And uh, like I'll even say to them, I go, are you sure you want that snare drum in the picture? You know, because they're not endorsing that snare drum. Yeah. But that's the snare drum they're using. Well, Jeff so- was the same way. I got pictures of Jeff and, you know, in the studio, he wasn't using a certain product. And I go, you sure? You know. And well, you had a great picture of, of Jeff out there, and I ask how he was and what kind of. And yeah, he was Jeff great. Bacaro. Great guy. Yeah. When I lived in L.A., yeah, I shot him for the cover. I had him sitting on a Toto bass drum, very famous cover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he had cowboy boots on. I remember. And he was showing me. He was working on a thing with his uh, bass drum, and I think Rich Redmond actually did a thing now about it. This <laughs> thing with his foot, where he slid his. Uh-huh. And I think it's on a Michael McDonald tune. And he was working on it. He was showing me. He said, they want me to do this. And, and he said, he had, he's shown me. And then uh, he said, you need, he, was, he would talk to me. And I went into his house. And, yeah. and he would say, do you need some drum heads? And I was broke when I lived in L.A. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, it, was, it was brutal. And I said, yeah. So he had me go meet uh, Paul Jamison down at a cartridge company. And Paul climbed up this ladder. And he was throwing drum heads at me. These Ludwig uh, jazz heads. <laughs> and uh, but Jeff was cool like that. He knew I needed stuff, you know, and he was willing to help me out. That's back when I was buying Drummer Choice drumsticks up at Guitar Center. Okay. On Sunset, <laughs> and, and if it if it went if it went, you know, rolled and didn't stop, I, I bought it. Because <laughs> they were so a lot of them were just so right. curved, you could play around corners and stuff. <laughs> yeah, the Chiquita sticker yeah. on them. But Jeff was really cool about that. Yeah. I shot Alex, Alex Van Halen back in those days for yeah. his cover. How was that? That was awesome. Yeah. They were rehearsing at on on, at, at, on La Cienega at might have been A M Studios. They were rehearsing for the US Festival, and I had to sign waivers that I was only going to take pictures of him, not David Lee Roth, not Alex, not uh, Eddie, yeah, nobody else. So yeah. I was doing the pictures of Alex, and, and they were all making faces at me and stuff. And I would I'd say nope. I'd shake my head no and put my camera down. <laughs> Valerie, Valerie Bertinelli was in the back knitting. It was a great thing, you know. It was just me and Alex. You know, I got pictures of him and his kit, and yeah. and the modern drummer used more pictures of him than any other drummer at that time in the article. Yeah, which really helped me out because I was broke. Yeah, so it was awesome. And then I went and showed Alex the pictures at their office, and uh, I'm sitting in this room, and and uh, David Lee Roth made me move because he was coming in to try outfits on in that room, so I had to go wait out in the hallway. Well, and, and this is when you awesome. were living in L.A. Yeah. So I mean, so I started getting cool stuff. Man, there was I had some great covers. You know, because I lived out there. Right, right. And uh, well, how did that first one come about? I mean, how did someone just, know? Well, Modern we- Drummer, you know, used a couple of my pictures that I shot in Pittsburgh. You know, but never a cover. You know, a little ins- uh, 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 Stuart Copeland, there was a picture of mine in his article. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a sneaky thing because they said no pictures. And his brother was the manager, I think, of the police back then. Ian. Ian and uh, they, mm-hmm. I didn't get any photo rights, you know, photo release, photo passes. Mm-hmm. So I just took that from a seat and... They used that picture. Yeah. You know, just little things like that. But then when I got to the to LA, I went, I want to cover. Yeah. 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 Man, there's so many, uh, I've got so many uh, back issues of Modern yeah. Drummer that oh, yeah. you could probably look through the box and say, yeah, I did this. Oh, I, I know this. exactly. Yeah, I, I remember shooting every picture. Yeah. Larry London. Uh, yeah. I had his great. cover. Yeah. How was that, man? How it was, was, we shot it at, I shot him twice in LA at the Golden Bear, maybe. He was playing with Adrian Ballou. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, yeah, remember just, what year? Again, eighty something, eighty whatever. Okay, yeah. He was a oh, Larry London. What a great guy! I'm so proud of him because I took pictures at a Zildjian day, and he was one of the drummers that came out. And mm-hmm. people were like, "Who's this guy from Nashville wearing Hawaiian shirts?" And he blew everybody away. Oh, I know. Standing ovation, and nobody knew who he was. Yeah, it was. I was so proud. That's awesome. 
and he was another guy that you know wanted me to move here. Yeah. I said, man, but that was before you moved to Nashville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd met him. Yeah, Zildjian Day in uh, Boston, or I have to I forget. I have to look it up. So after Virginia, I mean, did you did you make your way to Nashville because of all these people and and meeting Eddie? I mean, mostly Eddie. Was, yeah. Okay. And right. it wasn't so many drummers here. Man, there's just so many drummers here now. Yeah. Yeah. It hasn't been very difficult for me to populate the podcast uh, with. I'll bet. I still have a list that I I just barely made a dent in of people, and then I get recommendations. And uh, people come out of the woodwork, and it's been it's been really awesome. Now, I've got a few interviews of people outside of Nashville, but it's not like we aren't covering a wide range yeah. of styles and music. I mean, gosh, Troy Lucetta was just here a couple of days ago, and I'm thinking, what are you wow, doing in Nashville? Band, yeah, LA, what are you doing in and, Nashville? Yeah, right. right. So, but he's got lots of plates spinning here, and that's oh, good. So he's not playing drums then. He's doing a circus thing. Oh, he good. is. Oh, that good. really surprised me, but yeah. I wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for the, the podcast. Wow, what a talent. And Sandy Gennaro is here, and uh, it's unbelievable. Everybody yeah. wants to live in Nashville because the homes are affordable, or they were. You know, the people were selling their houses in L.A. and moving here with extra money, maybe buying a bigger time, house. Maybe it's time to go to L.A. And... That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> There's a lot of houses it's for sale deficit. out there. A lot of houses for sale. And deficit of drummers out there. Chester, no, Chester's think... here. Zorro's here. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You probably have all these drummers that you've gotten to know over the years. And I like to tell the story of when I shared a drum room with Chester Thompson. Hmm. And so he had just a handful of students. I had like two. So he had my number. So he'd call me, hey, uh, do you need the, uh, you know, and he's super mellow. Yeah. Do you need the drum room tonight, man? Uh, uh, no, I'm not teaching tonight. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Okay, cool. And I tell my friends, yeah, Chester Thompson just called me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great, but, great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For so many years when you're a kid and you're looking up at these guys, they're your heroes, and they seem so unapproachable. And most of the time, they are more than approachable. It's hard to imagine them sitting in front of a practice pad going, oh, man, my blisters, or I hope I don't cramp up. All the stuff we go through. Yeah. You can't imagine that these guys are sitting there, you know. Larry was awesome. Larry had a practice pad right in front of the television on a, on a coffee table. Yeah. And he would just sit there constantly, you know, while I was yeah. watching TV. and just, Yeah. yeah. And you don't, yeah. we look up at these guys, like you said. Yeah. And you can't imagine that they went through all this stuff. and. I feel like I get a little bit of that from the podcast. I get a chance to sit down and have one-on-one conversations with, great. with all these different people. And it's really, as long as I've been doing this, I still I still learn something every day. I always say this on the podcast. I learn something every time I talk to somebody. I Me too. It. I learn every time I take pictures. Well, that's what I was going to say. The drummer the other day that I shot, I did the same thing. I was just standing there and watching them. Mm-hmm. I said, man, I'm, I get free drum lessons off of everybody. Yeah. I've taken pictures of Gad and Buddy Rich and this guy I'm talking about and Kenny Aronoff. And yeah. So it's great when I go sub in these bands and they're going to go, we're going to do a John Mellencamp tune. I picture Kenny playing the song in my head. And immediately I'm playing left-handed hi-hat. You know, <laughs> Switch the toms around. Yeah. I mean, have, have there ever been more... As opposed see? to switching the time around, right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That used to be one of my things, too. I used to go, there's a first tom for everything. First when, I to, when I used to be a drum tech, they'd go, hit the first tom. i go, oh, there's a first tom for everything. Or, <laughs> Just hit the tom. Or they'd go, uh, <laughs> okay, do a, do a beat. And I would do a beat and they'd go, okay, throw in some fills. And I'd go... Phil Harris, <laughs> Phil Collins. You know, start. Yeah. <laughs> Phil Lash. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, oh, that's a good one. I could have used that one. Oh, was there it. ever a situation or a, a meeting that just compl- maybe you had a preconceived notion of who this type of person was, good or bad? Yeah, there's or some a guys story that, that you can share. Well, the cool. <laughs> there's this Matthew guy. No, uh, <laughs> no, there was a couple drummers that weren't nice to me. And then I just I don't listen to their records anymore. Isn't that hard? You know, there was a couple of guys I shot pictures of maybe somewhere, and then I'd go see them a second time. And there was one drummer in particular, an English drummer. Mm. And I went backstage, and I just said, man, can you sign this picture for me? And he said, no. Mm. I've hated the guy ever since. Mm. Weird, yeah. isn't it? Um, and so there's been some drummers that have been really good friends over the years, and, they'll, and I knew them before they were really big. Mm-hmm. And they've blown me off a couple of times, and that mm. makes me mad. Another yeah. guy in particular played here not too long ago. And I waited outside the the venue for like an hour and a half. Wow. Even though he knew I was going to be there and I was outside waiting. Wow. And that and I just went home. And then he texted me at two in the morning. 
and, t- and said, sorry, you know how things are sometimes. And I'm, I'm too old for that, you know, yeah, so. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah. I mean, drummers have that reputation for community, and they're, we yeah. get together, we have, there's the Zucha Weird, days and drum Weird, days and all that thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, at the same time. It, there's a mutual respect. We're all just, we're, we're hitting stuff yeah. with sticks, yeah. you know. Guys move here and they think they're the hot stuff in whatever city they come from. And they think they're just going to come here and walk in and start doing sessions. And it just doesn't work that way. Well, the time that you spent here, the time that you spent with drummers, what advice, I mean, I know you're saying this right now, but what advice would you have for somebody that's just moving to town? Because you have, we have all these people moving to town. Right. You, yeah. Listen. you got to listen. A lot. You can't talk. You have to listen, mm-hmm. you know, musically and uh, verbally. Mm-hmm. Do you think a podcast is a good place to start? I think it's a perfect place to start. Right. <laughs> is actually anybody going to hear this? <laughs> yeah. Are they going to listen? Yeah, right. Yeah. Are they going to listen? They're yeah. going to want to know what kind of mics you used and four twenty ones. That's a funny thing to me here about the gear. You know, that's the other thing: is endorsements. Man, these guys are just nuts with the endorsements here. Yeah. Everybody wants everything for free. Yeah. And it's just yeah. dry. It's just nuts. It Nobody, is no- I, don't, I don't get free cameras. You know, I deserve, I deserve them. Is there, a, yeah. is there a thing in the photography world? Yeah, there's guys that get free cameras. Yeah. I'm a member of the Nikon group where I can borrow stuff. Okay. Like a, almost like a co-op kind of situation. Well, you, call, you, you email them and say, I need this lens for a certain period of time, and they'll send it to you, and you have to pay insurance and shipping and then send it back. Okay. They don't just send me stuff, you know. And... uh and drums too. You know, these guys think they're out playing. They get the stuff for free. Man, you're working. That's your job. That's your tools. Right, right, right. That's right. just the way it is. Doctors aren't. Well, maybe they are getting free stuff. I don't know. They get free food. Free but, food. Uh, uh, doctors. Free uh, uh, kickbacks on the prescriptions that they're. I did. A, I did an uh, interview where I wrote. I did same thing, and I was a round table. I did the pictures and mm-hmm. recorded it. Mm-hmm. I did national drummers. Yeah, and like I said, something like, "What's everybody wearing?" Everybody said black, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I asked drummers, "Do you know the artist? Are you friends with the artist?" And some of them said no. One guy said he has to make an appointment if he wants to talk to the guy. The artist that they work for. Right. They don't even like. To me, that's that's a drag. I mean, I want to hang out. I want to be one yeah. of the guys. And yeah. yeah. You're just hired help. I remember one time I asked a drummer that Eddie was doing a session with. I said, "Who's your road drummer?" He didn't know. Oh my god. The artist couldn't give me the name of his drummer. Yeah. The first road gig I ever did when I moved to town, uh, the guy never... What was the name of the artist? I don't, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really know us very well. He never introduced us. And then one time, somebody from the audience said, Hey, who's your band? And he goes, Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, we got... Uh, let me see here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mike on keyboards. <laughs> Uh, Matt on drums, Scott. Oh, wow, you knew your name. You knew wow. our first name. <laughs> that's exciting. That's good. It took, him a, it took him a second. That's great. It took him a second. Well, and maybe that's something that... that and so guys have to check their ego at the door, as they say here. Yeah. You know? You can't be back there... Eh, I won't go into it, but... Uh, well, we're, we're, we read about our heroes. We have this preconceived notion about what it's like in the music business. And uh, I'm sure every town is different. And we can just oh, speak yeah. upon about oh, yeah. what we know. So this is kind of where we're at. Uh, it's the same thing. Like I know theater people that work here in these little community theaters, and they're awesome yeah. actors. They're stage presence, singing, dancing, whatever. And I go, why are you still in Nashville? Because if they went to New York, they would just be one of you know thousands that do that. Yeah. So they stay here, and they're leads in every show, and they work all the time. So and, there's got to be towns, and there's got to be places where. As a small fish in a big pond, you can go and maybe take that experience with you. And if you feel like you need to relocate from uh, maybe a non-music right. community or notoriously music community. I don't right. know if there's a glut here or not, but there's just drummers, man. It just it seems like there's drummers everywhere here. Well, I think and, every, and you meet people all the time. For, yeah, you know the. Um, one thing I wanted, I do want to address is digital technology. Yeah. It comes up in music. It comes up in photography. Yeah. Big time. Oh, yeah. It's great for me. It's a dream come true. How so? 
well, man, when I was a kid, I'm taking all these pictures and I had to make sure I had film with me and enough film and yeah. hope I don't run out of film and then I have to go get it developed. Yeah. My poor dad, you know, when I shoot black and white, we developed our own black and white. Mm-hmm. But if I shoot any color stuff, man, you have to pay to get that developed. Yeah. It was, my dad never, you know, it was, it was great. He let me do whatever I needed to do to take pictures. But now, digital, man, I never run out of anything. Yeah. I always have extra batteries and extra memory cards and mm-hmm. I take thousands and thousands of pictures. Mm-hmm. To get the four that the magazine's going to use, uh, mm. it's so much fun. One of the reasons I wanted to ask you about the kind of the digital technology is that we have uh, that that thing that's changing music, the way music is produced, the way especially drums are created, recorded in living for, rooms and basements and bedrooms. And, yep. Yeah. How has that changed? We we kind of see it. We've addressed that many times in the music business um, in discussions, but. As far as photography, though, is that affecting... Just the the fact that everybody's a freaking photographer now. Yeah. And everybody takes a... They get a great Nikon with a great lens, the kit lens, you know, and they put their camera on automatic, Mm -hmm. and they're out shooting pictures. Yeah. And everybody's a photographer. Everybody's standing in front of me, either with their phone or with their camera, their Nikon. They always have the strap, you know. Is that a threat to the industry? It is to me, you know. Yeah. I get... Just, I don't know, it's weird. I still think of myself as I'm 18 or 19 years old, and I'm not. <laughs> I still think of myself, even when I'm around you know, these musicians, I forget that I'm their age. Yeah. I'm older than Prince, you know, who passed away today. Yeah, that's it. It's weird to think that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think of myself like that. I'm still a kid with the Nikon yeah. getting into the concert to take pictures. Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a photographer. Yeah, I'm still thinking. you can't do I both. I still think like, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's exactly right. And it's the drummer. I know, I know. I know all. I've, yeah, I've heard all that stuff. <laughs> but it's the same way. I'm still like that, and I might, and I'm, I care. You know, I want these pictures to be right and good and sharp. Well, how and, do you adjust to that? How do you adjust to that? Those changes in technology. I get, I get, I'm, and, uh, and the older I get, the more moody I get. You know, if there's another photographer there. I that's, sometimes that's, I leave. I go, you don't need me, and I'll leave because I don't want the competition. I don't want to have to worry about where they are. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, and what they're doing, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't want to know about it. There's a billboard up uh, downtown that I, it's a picture that somebody took. It's a kind of a very arty kind of photograph, but it said taken by an iPhone 6S right, right, or whatever. Right. And I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to sell their product. Right. But it's not just a picture that you would take of your family or something like that normally that most of us do with our phones. But it's this kind of like, oh, we can be creative with this which yeah. is wonderful oh there's it's, it's unbelievable i mean there's my phone right there it's yeah it's incredible yeah but it's a whole other thing with a camera you know lenses and and even that's changed now they're coming out with mirrorless cameras there's no more click 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 right it's right. all digital the viewfinder and everything it's it's i have one camera like that it makes no sound yeah and it's great i can be very unobtrusive i'm at events now where i can take pictures during the event and turn the sound off uh-huh uh-huh. And uh, it's amazing, and I can control that camera with my phone. Mm-hmm. I could set that camera up over there and get the uh, app up on my phone, take pictures with my phone using that camera. Mm-hmm. Like in the back of the room, I take pictures on the stage. My camera's mounted, and I'm like, people think I'm texting, but I'm taking pictures. That article in Drum Magazine that just came out, you're in the article. They're talking yeah. to you about that stuff, and you also were the photographer. Yeah, I have the remote control in my hand. Right, I noticed right. the one hand was back there. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Scratching your butt, or you were taking pictures. My own butt, hopefully. Uh, okay, yeah. Wasn't, yeah. wasn't sure. I wasn't ever. I was never good at scratching other people's butts, which is why I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was really good at it, but. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, the technology is just again. Everybody's a photographer now. There's some photographers moving to Nashville that do what I do, and I'm like. Yeah, luckily, I still have my friends, but we'll see what happens. I don't know. You did a photo session recently, and you were talking about this this drummer, huge drummer that's going to be got some stuff coming up. And how did that come about? Well, I heard he was going to be doing a certain job, and yeah, and I called the magazine and I said, if he becomes a cover, I want the sh- I want the gig. I said, I'll fly to do it, whatever. You know, I'll pay for my own flight, and I want the cover. Mm-hmm. So it ended up he was coming to Nashville. So we arranged it, and I was the guy, and it was awesome. And I started texting, emailing, and talking to the drummer on the phone, setting up what we wanted to do and where and when. And and I got there, and we did some amazing pictures. We spent hours doing it. And yeah. uh, and then a little thing happened, and those pictures aren't going to be used now for uh, the cover. They're going to be used for other things, though. But that drummer I've known for 
20 or 30 years and that's a lot of my stuff you know i've yeah. known these guys and uh, there's guys right now i could text certain drummers now and they'll answer me right away and we're still friends yeah which is really cool i'm just wondering just kind of procuring this work you know as far yeah. as uh you know it's like you have these relationships that have been built upon over years and and then the work the reputation of your work you know and then but it still is based on a lot of the same things that musicians use to get their work get sessions yeah good yeah. personality and good sessions I try not work, to, uh, anything the word we have a natural word called germing mm-hmm. i try not to do that even when you're a tech you have to be really careful about that right right i hung out with eddie and you know and hopefully i i mean i was I had a lot of sessions. I would be one of the guys. We'd go on the road, and mm-hmm. everybody knew who I was, and I'd help everybody. Yeah. You know, I remember never... we were doing a, a show somewhere, and the keyboard player looks over at me and goes, come here. And I would sit next to Eddie all the time at his live show, or I would sit I'd sit right there. And uh, this guy, come here, come here. And I went over. He goes, I left my charts in the dressing room. And the show had started already, you know, so I ran to the dressing room and came back and gave him his charts. Yeah. You know, and thanks, man, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Check. <laughs> Yeah, that's well. No, there, I mean, there was no check. No, I, we've. Uh, um, I had never heard of the word germing before. It's a na- it must be a natural word. I think it is, but it's basically when you're just. I don't. Well, how do you best describe it? You know, when you're when somebody famous comes. I remember Steve Winwood came into Forks. When oh yeah, I was yeah, working yeah. There, yeah. And um, <laughs> you just treat that person like anybody else. But when you start right. asking for autographs or asking them can't questions, do it. yeah, can't you know, do it. No. Modern drummer, man. We I've been around with them. We used to just be friends. I knew everybody at the magazine. Mm-hmm. They had drummer uh, modern drummer festivals. I shot the first four of those okay. with Lissa Wales. Yeah, we shot them together, and it was awesome. I met you know I knew everybody. Yeah, I mean everybody did those things. That was a really prestigious thing. Yeah, I remember I went outside. There was a, a line, huge line, waiting to get in. Mm-hmm. And I said I went out there. I was taking pictures of the line, and I went. Dave Weckl's in there tuning his drums. Does anybody have a drum key? And there's like hundreds of guys I know. You know, <laughs> looking in their pockets for a drum key. It it's was attached awesome. to my house key, but yeah, you can have it. <laughs> it Please, was great. So for Dave Weckl, yeah, here you go. It was great. And he was just in town. Uh, was he? Days, he Wednesday. He was already here, or is it coming up? The 20th. It was Tuesday or Wednesday. It was like yesterday or the day before. I was going to find him. He's coming back, too, with Chick Corea. Oh. Was, that was Oz Noy. Yes, right. that's right. Oh my gosh! I don't know how I missed that. Um, well, but, but I mean, but now, like moving forward, looking in the next couple of years, just, I just I go day to day. I don't really, you know, I don't have a steady job. Mm-hmm. I have, you know, people call me and just call me to do a show on June something, rehearse the day before and do a show the next day, and that's fine. And yeah, I have, I always have something to do. Yeah, it's great. I mean, all the stuff I do, I take pictures of a lot of theater things if i'm not playing drums i'm taking pictures at them yeah and it's like a little thing i do now okay and 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 what percentage of photography involves music or drums hopefully most of it but uh yeah not all of it yeah i do a lot of events you know bar mitzvahs and yeah and stuff like that yeah and uh i'm getting older though there's things i don't want to do anymore yeah and i'm getting to the point where i just don't want to do that anymore sure so when people say uh we'll call you i go okay I don't even. Right. I don't want to want him to call me. Yeah, it just seems to be like the the, the gift uh, that that you're given with, as you get older. You can you can say no. It's okay. Right. And now I'm now you're now I'm one of the guys. You know, I used to see these older guys and go, man, how come they only have three or four drums? You know, they're playing a wedding. You know, and you're you're at home with this my Rogers kit with a 24 inch bass drum and 13, 14, 16, 18 inch toms and. Memory yeah. lock symbol stands and yeah. these guys are sitting there with a four piece. I'm one of those four piece kits now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't you yeah. don't want to bring all that stuff anymore. You don't need to bring that stuff anymore. Oh right, yeah. And it's pretty funny how it just turns around. You become one of the guys. And... But there's certain gigs I bring too much stuff. Right. Just because I want to play it. Why know? did you bring the the, the Glockenspiel? Yeah. In this bar gig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or my timpani. <laughs> but no, I still bring stuff that I, I usually bring what I need, like for theater. I bring what I need and what the show needs. Okay. I've always been that way. If there's a cowbell or woodblock that's important to the show, I mean, I bring it. I see other drummers that don't do that. And it it needs it. You know? Right, right. Siren whistle, uh, industrial horn. You know, I still have all this stuff for years and years ago. 
Why I not buy it to? once and I keep it. How often know? do you get to use that? I mean, how, All the time. Not? All the time. And then I right. play in the big band and I use the siren whistle. We do some stuff from the 40s. Yeah. And I'll end a song with it. You know, splash them. We'll oh, and it's, and it's a big hit. Yeah. You know, no, no other drummers don't do that. Attention to detail that, that people appreciate. Authent- authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You play all this stuff on the snare drum. Well, I took pictures in 1983 at Zildjian Day in Boston. Then the next day they had their 360th anniversary party. Jeez. At Zildjian. Yeah. And I was the photographer. And I got there early before anybody else got there. And I walked through the factory all by myself. Just, wow. Even now, I, I get chills just thinking of the cool stuff I've yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. That was awesome. That's amazing. Peter Erskine. I mean, everybody was at that party. Yeah, yeah. And I used to know Armin Zildjian. I, he knew me. And, you know, I'd say, can I take your picture? Sure. I got portraits of these guys. They would yeah. pose for me. Hal Blaine. Yeah. Uh, let me do this, man. Uh, let me just say thank you and for coming over and taking the time. To oh, man, the steak was delicious. Really. You know, it's Medium not, well, just how I wanted it's it. It's not very filling thank either, man. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> no, Rick, I appreciate it. Oh, me too. Thank you, dude. I'm flattered and honored, man. It's cool. Awesome. So there you go. There was Rick. Um, if you know Rick Malkin, in, uh, especially if you live in Nashville, he turns up at every drumming event you can think of. Uh, he just he's really involved in the community and takes some great pictures and I know that I have a stack of modern drummer magazines that uh, he's been involved with it was just an honor to get to know Rick a little bit better from this interview once again I want to say thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical help stay tuned next week where uh, my co-host Zach Albetta will be presenting his podcast keep in touch with us Instagram Twitter Facebook those things always help us grow So thanks for listening, and I hope to see you around. Bye-bye.